Do you want to be part of something bigger? At Siemens, we use AI to transform the everyday. Our engineering solutions drive innovation and change. We're leading in technology and building a sustainable future. Join Siemens and make an impact to transform the everyday. Apply now and be part of something extraordinary. Visit Siemens.co.intarcareers. It's the Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Good morning and welcome everyone to Mutual Presents. It's been a long week and I'm preparing for our trip to England. So Penny the Cat and I are on our favorite couch, ready to wind back those clocks for another Tuesday Terror Presents. The Traveler with the Symphony of Death and, if you believe, so be prepared to be chilled to the bone. The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? We're going to call on Edward Farrington and his three sisters. A little family of four who love each other devotedly. And whose story I call... The Symphony of Death. Edward Farrington and his sisters live by themselves in a large, gloomy old house on the outskirts of Boston. It is evening, and Edward is on his way home when his attention is attracted by a small establishment which is advertising a close-out sale. An economical and foresighted man, Edward stops his car and enters the dimly lighted shop. Good evening, sir. May I serve you? I'm not sure. I saw your sign, and it occurred to me that by purchasing now, something I'm sure to need sooner or later, I might save a substantial sum. You are very foresighted, sir. Now, here is a design I can recommend unreservedly. A simple white column, yet cut from the finest Carrara marble. I see. The angel on top is of a single piece with a shaft. It can never be dislodged or separated. In every inch, in every line, it expresses dignified grief. Yes, I agree with you, but I'm afraid it's too expensive. What are these stones here in the corner? Please. Uh, they are our simplest design. Polished granite cubes with just enough room for the name and the date. They are excellent memorials, but I am sure in the long run you will get greater satisfaction from something more appealing to the eye. No, no, I think these will do excellently. Yes, they're just what I had in mind. I'm particularly pleased by the fact that they're all alike. I see. You wish all four of them, then? No, not four, just three. Three will quite prepare me for all eventualities. Will you be able to store them for me until they're needed? Yes, we can store them at our main warehouse, if you wish. Excellent. I suppose I might as well give you the inscriptions to be carved on them while I'm here. And you can leave room for the dates to be added. Of course, sir. Then if you'll just take this down. In loving memory of Florence... Sister of Edward Farrington. Yes, sir. In loving memory of Martha, sister of Edward Farrington. In loving memory of Emily, sister of Edward Farrington. Edward, is that you? Yes, Emily. Oh. You're all wet. Yes, it's beginning to rain. Let me help you with your coat, Edward. I'll hang it up for you. Now, Emily, please don't fuss over me this way. It makes me nervous to be poured at. But I just want to help you with your coat. I can hang it up by myself. Emily, is that Edward? Oh, Edward, you're late. 
We were worried about you. I'm here, and I'm perfectly all right, Florence, as you can see. Now, is dinner ready? Oh, yes, Edward. Martha has everything ready. Martha, Edward's home. What? Oh, oh, it's you, Edward. Well, we were worried about you. Martha, I've told you not to worry if I'm a few minutes late. Well, I suppose we just can't help it, Edward. Now we'll eat. And perhaps after dinner, you will play the piano for us. Oh, will you, Edward? Please, say yes. Please, Edward. Well, we'll see. I really should work on my symphony tonight, but perhaps I can play for a few minutes after dinner. And so, after dinner, Edward played for his sisters on the great piano in the library. Emily and Florence crowded close to him as he played, and Martha, busy with her knitting, sat and watched them with fond gaze. Oh, that was lovely, Edward. Please play some more. Yes, something we can sing. Well, all right, just one more and that's all. You mustn't jump like that. It can't hurt you. Uh, I know, but I, I can't help it. I like thunderstorms. I like to watch the lightning. I think that's enough for tonight. Now off to bed, both of you. All right. Good night, Edward. Good night, Edward. Good night, Emily, Florence. Well, I suppose I might as well go to bed myself. No, Martha, don't go yet. I uh, want to talk to you. To me? Yes. What about Edward? How old are you? How old? I'm 35. Oh, no. Why be silly about it? I'm 37. <laughs> you ought to get married. You still could. And you owe it to yourself. I shall never marry, Edward. I promised Father that I'd look after things and keep the four of us together as long as we live. And I will. As long as we live. But perhaps we'd be better off if we weren't together. You can't mean that. But I do. I need solitude in which to finish my book and my symphony. It's very distracting, you know, to have the three of you constantly hovering about me. You're just feeling blue tonight. You wouldn't be happy without us any more than we would be without you. No, we'll all be together, the four of us, as long as we all live. Well, now I'm going to bed. Good night, Edward, dear. Good night, Martha. We'll all be together, the four of us, as long as we live. As long as we all live. In the morning, it was still raining. After breakfast, Edward shut himself in the library to continue work on his symphony... Edward, play well, Emily. Edward's a wonderful player. Let's listen a minute before we go upstairs. Do you think he'd really mind if we went in? If we just sat very quiet? I don't think so. We'll be very quiet. Uh, who's there? Oh, it's you two. We're sorry, Edward. We didn't mean to disturb you. We'll go right away. No, you don't have to go. You mean we can stay, Edward? For a minute. I'm going to stop for a smoke. I'll bring you the cigarette. Oh, the cigar box is empty. Empty? Why, I was positive I had plenty of cigarettes. That's why I didn't buy any yesterday. You did have a lot yesterday. I saw them. Well, they're gone now. And I suppose I'll have to drive down the hill to the drugstore and get some more. And that will mean I'll get nothing done this morning, nothing whatever. I wish I had someone I could send for them. Edward, let me go for you. In this rain? Why, you'd get soaking wet, Florence. Well, 
I could take the car. Take the car in weather like this? But I'm a good driver, Edward. You once said so yourself. And I have a driver's license. You know I have. You helped me get it. Yes, that's true. Well, I'd be very careful, Edward. Well, you must promise to drive very slowly down the hill to town. Oh, I will, Edward. All right, then, Florence. Here's the key to the car. The old car, of course. Now, be very careful. Oh, I will. I promise I will. May I stay and listen until Florence comes back? Well, I suppose so, seeing you're here already. You don't like us to be around, do you? Sometimes I think you don't like us at all anymore. Oh, that's nonsense. It's just that I'm trying to get a great piece of music written, and you keep disturbing me. Oh, there goes Florence in the car now. She's going fast. Florence likes to go fast, and then step on the brakes. She promised to be careful. I know, but she forgets. Well, I'm sure she'll be all right. Now I must get to work. I'm perfectly comfortable, Martha. I don't need a jacket. You mustn't take chances. Here, put it on. Oh, all right. Emily, where's Florence? Is she up there? Uh -huh. Oh, no. She's gone to get Edward some cigarettes. Gone out? In this rain? Edward let her take the car. Edward, you didn't. Martha, please don't get excited. She can drive and she promised to be careful. But you promised never to let her drive alone. You know how she drives unless someone's with her. Really, she's a better driver than you think. There's nothing to be alarmed about. She'll be back any minute and then... I'll answer it. No, it's probably for me. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Farrington. Uh, the police. Edward, what is it? Hush, Martha. Uh, what, what about my sister? She did what? All right. Yes, yes, of course. I'll be right down. Edward, what is it? What's happened to Florence? Martha, we must all be very calm. Florence has had a terrible accident. Oh, no. The brakes of the car apparently gave way at the bottom of the hill. Florence ran off the curb and crashed into the rocks there. She was killed instantly. <laughs> The official investigation into poor Florence's death established only the fact that the brakes had failed. But the brakes had only been checked the day before, as Edward proved to the police. Accordingly, they ascribed death to an unfortunate mechanical failure and closed the case. Edward, however, could not dismiss it from his mind so easily. Edward, you can't go on like this day after day, brooding about poor Florence's death. Oh, my dear, I blame myself for it if I hadn't better take the car. I know, Edward. Why don't you try to work on your symphony? It'll help take your mind off, Florence. No, no, I can't possibly do any work on that yet for a while. No, but I have another notion. I think I'd like to write our family history. Our oh, family history? Yes, and it seems to me that once in Mother's old trunk in the attic, I saw a lot of letters that were written to her by relatives. Are they still there? Why, yes, they are. Now, I'd like to look them over. They might help me get started on my history. Will you show me where they are, Martha? Why, yes, of course. We'll go up to the attic and I'll get them out for you right after lunch. Here are the letters, Edward. Mother wrote a lot of letters those last few years. After the doctor said she must never leave the house. Yes, I remember. How quiet and dark it is up here in the attic. We used to play hide-and-go-seek here, the four of us. Yes. Until Mother died. I've often wondered about that. She uh, fell from one of these attic windows, I remember. She was leaning out, looking at the river, and uh, she slipped. Yes. It was that window there. The one looking down into the courtyard. I'd like to look at it. Oh, the catch is stuck. Will you help me open it, Martha? Well, all right. There. It's almost 
50 feet down to the courtyard. She was killed instantly, wasn't she? Yes. But let's close it now. In a moment. Martha, did Mother really slip and fall, or did she throw herself out? What makes you ask that? I was only eight at the time, but it seems to me Mother was wandering badly in her mind there at the end. And then I recollect hearing Father say something about an asylum to Uncle George. Edward, you mustn't say that ever again. It would terrify Emily. But it's true, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Poor Mother. It's strange you calling her mother because she wasn't really your mother. No, but I always think of her as mother. I was only two when father married her. Poor creature. Let's believe that she slipped. It would be easy to slip from this window, wouldn't it? Well, the sill isn't very low. Yes, but lean out a little farther and see how easy it would be. No, a little farther. You see how overbalanced one becomes? Yes, yes, you're right. Now, help me back, Edward. Of course. Martha, catch yourself. Martha! <laughs> Poor Martha's tragic death, coming so soon after Florence's, was a great shock to Emily and Edward. But Edward uh, recovered from the tragedy somehow after a few weeks, and as though determined not to let it upset him, spent many hours a day at his beloved piano, working on his projected masterpiece. Oh, Edward, that was wonderful. You played just like you used to, before Florence and Martha died. Yes, I'm getting my old touch back. You don't mind my coming in to listen, do you? Not today, but Emily, you have been disturbing me these last few weeks. Must you follow me around all the time? But, Edward, you know how much I like to be near you. And now that, that Florence and Martha are gone, I haven't anyone else to talk to. Yes, I know that, but I can't get any work done unless I'm left in peace. I won't bother you anymore, I promise. You know... I do, Miss Florence and Martha. Of course you do. But just the same, it's been awfully nice having you all to myself since they went. I'm afraid it's very lonely for you. Oh, no, it isn't. I like it. Yes, but I think we'll have to get a housekeeper. She'd be company for you and she'd look after things. In fact, I'm going into town to interview a housekeeper today, a Mrs. McDonald. You'd like to go with me, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, Edward. We'll take the car and have a nice drive at the same time. Oh, that'll be fun. Now, how would you like to go out and get the car started for me? Get the car started? Yes, I have to tend to a few things before we go, and the motor needs to warm up. It's not working very well. Oh, Edward, do you think I could start it? Of course you could. Just turn on the switch and step on the starter, and then let it run until it's good and warm. All right, Edward. May I have the key? Yes. Here you are. Now, this is the ignition key. Mm -hmm. And use the little side door to get in. I'll unlock the big doors when I come out. Uh, I can pretend I'm driving it. Will you be long? No, just sit in the car and wait until I come. All right, Edward. Here I am, Emily. I took longer than I expected. I hope you haven't been sitting here with a motor running all this time. Emily! Emily! With Emily's unfortunate death from carbon monoxide poisoning, Edward Farrington was left quite alone in the great old house. His neighbors saw little of him though they could hear him at his piano for many hours each day. They knew, however, that a week after Emily's funeral, he hired a housekeeper, Mrs. McDonald, to take charge of the house for him. Now, Mrs. McDonald, this is your first day, and before you start, I'd like to explain a few things to you. Of course, Mr. Farrington. As you know, I've suffered the tragic loss of all my sisters in the past few months. Oh, yes, sir, a great sorrow it must have been. 
But they do say tragedies come in threes. Indeed, they seem to. But I'm sure I'll be quite comfortable now with you to look after me. I surely hope so, sir. I'm certain of it. Now, uh, I'm a rather moody man, and I'm working upon some music for which I have great hopes. Yes, sir. Above all else, I wish to be left alone. I do not want to be disturbed. Is that understood? Quite, Mr. Farrington. You may call me at mealtimes. At all other times, I prefer that you do not even enter this part of the house. I understand. Good. That's all, I think. Just put up with my little oddities, and we'll get along very well. Yes, sir. Then uh, I'll see about the ordering for dinner now, sir, if you'll excuse me. Now, let me see. The second movement needs touching up, so perhaps I'd better... What is it, Mrs. MacDonald? I thought I said I was never to be disturbed. I'm very sorry, sir, but there's a gentleman come to see you. It's Detective Barnes, sir, from the police. From the police? Am I to be bothered with more stupid questions? Well, show him in. I suppose I must see him. Yes, sir. Will you go in, sir? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Farrington. You remember me, I think. Yes, yes, Mr. Barnes, I remember you. In view of the number of ridiculous and unnecessary questions you asked me after the deaths of my poor sisters, I have good reason to remember you. I've come to ask you more questions, Mr. Farrington. Tell me, did your sister Emily have a driver's license? I, I really don't know, and I don't care. You should care. Listen to me. First, your sister Florence died in an auto accident when brakes that had just been inspected failed to work. Even modern automobiles aren't proof against mechanical failure. Then Martha died in a fall from an attic window. Her body landed in the courtyard a full six feet from the wall of well, the house. Well, what of that? It was much too far away for her to strike. Unless she leaped or was pushed. And you have said she didn't leap. I repeated she did not leap. She fell. Perhaps. Now we come to Emily. She died of carbon monoxide poisoning in a closed garage. Well? You have said it happened because she went to get the car out to drive you downtown. That was your statement under oath. And a perfectly accurate statement. But I have just learned from the neighbors that Emily didn't know how to drive a car. Why? Why, of course she could. Furthermore, they say her mental condition was such she could never learn to drive. Well, perfectly absurd. Did she have a driver's license? I repeat, I do not know. Because if she didn't, your statement is false. And if any part of your statement proves false, Mr. Farrington, I trust I make my meaning clear. Mr. Barnes, you can't show one jot of evidence to back up your ridiculous suspicions. Any court in the land would laugh at you for them. I can show no direct evidence. But there is such a thing as circumstantial evidence. You haven't even any circumstantial evidence. I have a world of it. The brakes on your car fail, and you are an amateur mechanic. Well? Martha's body falling so far from the building that she must have been pushed. Mere conjecture. Finally, Emily dying in a car she couldn't drive. Though you have said she was going to drive you downtown. And she was. You've done nothing but build a tissue of fantastic suspicions. A jury will take them more seriously. Especially when they learn that just before the first death, you bought three tombstones. One for each of your sisters. That shows what you were planning. It shows nothing. It was a sale. I was merely being foresighted. Then, Mr. Farrington, why didn't you buy four stones? One for each of you. I refuse to discuss the point. There was no reason for me to kill my sisters. No normal reason, perhaps. Though now that you are alone, you are living very comfortably on the income from your father's estate. Indeed. Furthermore, Mr. Farrington, I have checked on your family history. I know the truth about your unfortunate mother. Well... The fact concerning her might cause the jury to look differently upon you. It might influence the jury to bring in a verdict of murder while of unsound mind. Get out. Get out of this house, do you hear? You can prove nothing, nothing whatsoever. All right, Mr. Farrington, I'm going. But I'll be back. Uh, no, wait. Uh, I'm ill. Help me, I... Here, here, sit here. That's it. it it's my heart. There's medicine in my desk drawer. There. A, a small bottle. In the desk here? Yes. Here's a blue bottle. Is this it? Yes. Hurry. There's water in the thermos jug. Yes, I have it. Here's the water and the pill. Swallow it. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, that's better. The pain is going away. Then, Mr. Farrington, I'll be on my way. I warn you, I'm going to check as to whether Emily had a driver's license. 
Today is Sunday, so it may take me a few hours. But if I find she had no license, I'm going to return with a warrant for your arrest. No. There's no need for that. Of course, the poor simpleton had no driver's license. I should have thought of that. I should have thought of that. Then you admit you killed her. Certainly I did. Why shouldn't I? She annoyed me. Me, a genius. I'm afraid a jury won't care whether you're a genius or not, Mr. Farrington. Do you suppose I care what a jury thinks? A genius is not answerable to the laws that bind other people. The law does not agree with you. The law? What do I care for the law? You think you've trapped me, don't you? But you haven't. You hear? You haven't. I think I have, Mr. Farrington. You fool. No one is going to put Edward Farrington in an asylum. No one. In a minute, I'll be beyond your reach. What do you mean? I mean that tablet you so obligingly got for me is a deadly poison. Poison that I bought months ago. You and your circumstantial evidence. You're never going to get a chance to use... Never get a chance to blacken my name. But, but Detective Barnes... Yes, what is it? Uh, promise me one thing. Promise me you won't let them bury me with my sisters. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little visit with Edward Farrington and his three loving sisters? You know, perhaps Edward made a mistake after all when he didn't buy a, a fourth tombstone. Uh, by the way, do you live in a gloomy old house with three sisters who love you so much you can't bear to have them near you? Well, if you do, I'd advise you not to be too drastic with them. You might find yourself buried right beside them, as Edward was. I know another man who... Oh, you're getting off here. Well, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. But before we tell you of next week's exciting story... Here is Maurice Tarplin, the mysterious traveler himself, with a brief but vital message from your government. You all know that the stories we tell on this program are just stories, designed to entertain you, but not to be taken too seriously. Well, what I have to say now, however, is not a story, and is deadly serious. All over the world, people are starving. The United States and other food-producing nations are fighting a battle against famine. To win... Food stocks must be conserved. You can help conserve them by canning and preserving food for your own use. If you have a victory garden, put up as much as possible from it. When your local markets feature an abundance of fruits or vegetables suitable for home preservation, can or preserve a winter's supply and release that much commercially canned food for the starving. Conserve your sugar for canning purposes. Follow the wartime rule of one pound of sugar to four quarts of finished fruit. And be sure to use only safe, tested methods. If you want information on any phase of home food preservation, write to the United States Department of Agriculture, Washington 25, D.C. Thank you, Maurice Tarplin. In addition to Maurice Tarplin, today's cast included Eric Dressler, Hester Sondergaard, Ann Tiemann, Inga Adams, and Martin Wilson. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled, As I Lie Dying. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. Stay tuned to this station for another exciting crime drama, True Detective Mysteries, which immediately follows station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The 
Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Why, tonight we're going on a little excursion into the realm of pure imagination. You've all heard the old saying, believe in a thing enough and it'll come true. Well, suppose, just suppose many people came to believe in something, something that couldn't possibly be real. Such as an artificial monster growing in a scientist's laboratory. What would happen? Well, if you want to know what might happen, uh, listen to the story I call If You Believe. My story begins in a rambling old house deep in the woods. In a homemade laboratory, gray-haired Professor Jonathan Davis is peering eagerly into a large glass container that holds an odd, transparent, jelly-like substance. Ellen! Oh, Ellen! Yes, sir? Ellen, come quick. I'm coming, dear. What is it? Ellen, look. I think... I think I've succeeded at last. Oh, Dad. You look. Your eyes are better than mine. Yes, his... Isn't there movement in the protoplasm this time? Isn't it stirring? J- just a little? No, Dad. There isn't any movement. No? You're positive, Ellen? I, I was sure I saw some sign of light. I'm quite positive, Dad. Now, please, won't you admit that what you're trying to do is impossible? No, Ellen, no. I will succeed. I know it. Now, come, we've got to try another feeding mixture. If you hand me the saline solution and dextrose, now I'll begin again. But while Professor Davis labored in his lonely seclusion to make a lifelong dream come true, something that was to affect him vitally was happening in the editorial room of the largest newspaper in the nearby city. Steady desk, Benson speaking. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. McGuire. Yes? Well, yes, sure, I've been reading Dan Duncan's special features. I edit them. I see. You don't think they've been colorful enough lately, huh? Well, to tell the truth, I agree with you. I've been meaning to speak to him about it. Yes. Sure, I'll do it now. He just came in. Right. Right. Good night, Mr. McGuire. Hey, Dan. Yeah, Joe. What cooks? The big boss just phoned down. What's he want? Well, frankly, he thinks you're slipping. McGuire thinks I'm slipping. Well, I like that. That's what he said. And I've done everything to get hot material except to go out and commit a murder myself. Well, maybe he's tired of murders. You want to know why you don't turn up something like that haunted house story you did last spring? Why, I don't. <laughs> that was a good story, wasn't it? It was a honey. Yeah. Especially the description of the way the ghost of the drowned girl walked around the house, leaving wet spots where it stepped. You know, I caught a heck of a cold walking around in wet socks to make those footmarks. No more than you deserve for faking a story. You're faking a story. Listen, Benson, any time a million readers believe a story, it's true. And they believed in that ghost. Every one of them. I'm not saying they didn't, but McGuire wants another story just as good. I've got a good mind to tell the old buzzer to fly a kite. Another story like... Hey. Huh? What is it? I think I got it. Hey, Ted. Ted Jones. Oh, yeah, Dan. Front and center. Oh, yeah, what is it, Dan? All right, dump your camera on the desk and sit. Okay. Now, tell me, what was that story you told me last week about some professor living up in the woods back at town, never coming out of his private lab? Oh, you mean uh, Professor Davis? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Well, what about him? There was a fuss over something he said in the lecture one day, wasn't there? A fuss? Well, it was more like an explosion. Hey, wait a minute. I remember that case. 
Professor claimed he could create an artificial man, wasn't that it? No, 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 no. He said that an artificial man might be produced someday. Uh, might be. Well, the paper said he claimed he could create one. Yeah, I know. Well, it made a good story, didn't it? And drove Professor Davis out of the university into retirement. Oh, the school didn't like the publicity. Water under the bridge, kid. Anyway, here's the old professor working away secretly for the last five years. All alone? No, no, he, he wasn't all alone. His daughter Ellen's with him. How old is she? Oh, she was 15 then, so... She's 20 now. Good looking? Well, I was in Professor Davis's class. I remember as a, well, as a skinny brat with uh, yellow hair. Yeah, good, a blonde. So here's the prof secretly working with his beautiful blonde daughter at what? All right. What? Why, he's trying to prove he was right. He's trying to create a, an artificial man. Say, you got something there. Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't know Professor Davis is trying to create artificial life. Well, we soon will. You know where his hideout is, don't you? Yeah. Oh, all right, then grab your camera. Let's get going. Oh, now, wait a minute, Dan. Suppose you find Professor Davis is... Ah, oh, forget it. Benson, save me two columns. Come on, Ted. We're on our way. <laughs> Now, we must warm it ever so gently. It'll stay at blood heat until morning. And then, Ellen... Oh, I hope so, Dad. But, darling, if you fail again, won't you please promise me to stop trying to create this artificial protoplasm? Well, we'll talk about that in the morning. Now, uh... Oh, who could that be? I'll go see, Dad. Yes? I'm Ted Jones, Miss Davis. <laughs> I don't suppose you remember me. Ted Jones. Oh, you were one of Father's students, weren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm a newspaper photographer now. Oh. Uh, could we come in? I have a friend with me, a reporter. Ellen, and... who is it? Uh, newspaper men, Dad. They want to see you. Newspaper men, don't let them in. Send them away. I right, come now, Professor. We just want to ask you a couple of questions, and uh, but we can talk better inside, so... Uh. There. Now we can talk like friends. Hey, but, Dan, we weren't invited in. How dare you force your way in here? Get out, both of you. Please go. Dan, come on. Professor Davis doesn't want to talk to us. Keep your shirt on, Ted. Just a couple of questions, Professor. Now, isn't it true that hidden away here you're creating artificial life? I won't answer your questions. You just print more lies and ruin everything I'm trying to do. Then you are creating artificial life, huh? Young man, I... Tell me how far you've gotten. You figuring on springing an artificial man on us one of these days? You fools. While I still struggle to create synthetic protoplasm, you talk of artificial men. Go, go before I throw you out. Please go, please. Come on, Dan, we're leaving. Okay, we're going. Thanks for the interview, Professor. Read all about it in tomorrow's curtain. The imbeciles. What do they know of science? All they want is to cheapen my work. Make it a sensation for the headlines. Oh, please, Father, you must get control of yourself. They're gone now. Yes, yes, they are. Well, they shan't interfere with my work. Well... Come, we must adjust the heat and... Ellen. Ellen. Yes, Dad, what is it? Ellen, the mixture's moving. This time I'm sure of it. The protoplasm. It's alive. Say, Dan, this is something. Huh? Behind bolted doors deep in the woods... Professor Jonathan Davis toils night and day to create the world's first synthetic man. In a great vat lies a strange caricature of humanity. It has a head, arms, legs, a body, all of them fashioned of a pale green substance like gelatin. Nice touch, huh? Day by day, life stirs more strongly in this grotesque creation of science. Someday it may breathe, walk, eat, now, look, Dan, aren't you going pretty strong? Ah, oh, forget it. The old man wants a story, doesn't he? Besides, the professor really is working on synthetic protoplasm. Maybe he has got a pale green monster in his bathtub. How do I know? Okay, Dan, but you're, if you're faking this story, I know nothing about it. Faking it? You know I never fake stories. Okay. We'll set this up and put it in the press wires. By noon tomorrow, 40 million people will be believing in Professor Davis' artificial monster. By noon tomorrow, I'll be believing in it myself. Read all about it. Find a great artificial man. Read all about it. Read all about it. Read all about it. And so, all over the
another nation, people read the story and marveled and believed. While in the laboratory, hidden in the woods. Oh, look. This time, this time it is alive. It is. There can be no doubt of it. Well, this is... He's certainly moving, Dad. Yes, see? And the protoplasm is breathing. Listen. You can hear it. I've created artificial life, Ellen. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid so, Dad. Afraid so? What do you mean? I think she just takes us down at the university when they hear of this. It's grown since last night. Yes, it has. The cells are multiplying like true protoplasm. That's why I transferred it to the staff tank. Now I'm a sad salt, acid, phosphorus. Oh, that, that must be grocery boy. Excuse me, Dad. Yes? Oh, you... Uh, Miss Davis, I hope that you'll let me apologize. We have nothing to say to you. Please don't shut the door before I explain. Explain? There's nothing to explain. You force your way in here. I came to apologize for that, is it? Well, have you seen the morning papers? We're not interested in the papers. I'm afraid you'll be interested in this one. Look. Oh, how outrageous. That story of your father creating an artificial man is in every paper in the country, and I... Well, I feel I'm to blame, and... I want to make up for it. Can I come in so we can talk? I guess you'd better, Mr. Jones. But Dad mustn't see this paper. Oh, no, no, of course not. But won't he recognize me? No, I don't think so. He's very nearsighted. I'll just tell him that you used to be one of his students. And if you'll tell me the real truth, I'll try to get the paper to understand that Dan Duncan just made up his story. Who is it, Ellen? Uh, it, it's Ted Jones, Dad, one of your former students. He, he called to say hello. Jones, eh? Jones? Yes. Ted Jones? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Organic chemistry, wasn't it, Joan? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> You're the one who kept breaking things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jones, I, I have something here you'd be very interested in. Come and see. Yes, sir. Look. That stuff in the tank. It seems to be alive. Mm -hmm. It is alive. Synthetic protoplasm, my boy, the first ever created... It's breathing, yes, and it's also growing. Life becomes stronger in it by the moment. It, it's changing color, Dad. It's becoming a pale green. Yes, it's growing fast. Very fast. I never dreamed that success would come Hello, completely. Well, Hi, Dan. I thought I'd find you here. Why, Dan. Dan Duncan himself. Hiya, Professor. What do you want here? Oh, just a few pictures. Shot of you in your lab, so far. You have the nerve to come here after what you've done. What I've done? You haven't seen anything yet. You and your father are big news now. You're going to be bigger. Dan, you'd better go. Better go? I don't follow you, kid. I said you'd better go. There isn't any story here for you. No story? Hey, what's eating you? Aren't you here to get a follow-up? No, I came here to get the truth. Something you wouldn't be interested in. Hey, what kind of talk is that? Are you going to go or will I have to throw you out? Throw me out? Now listen, kid. You want me to try it? All right, I will. Oh, you... oh. Okay. Okay, I'm going. Take your hands off me. But don't think you can get away with this. You're fired. And that's all right with me. And as for you, Professor, you and your artificial man are going to be so well-known in a day or two, you'll be getting offers from Hollywood. And so, with each edition of the papers, the headlines grew bigger. Telegraph wires carried editorials condemning Professor Davis. Is it a man or is it a monster Professor Davis has created? By his refusal to answer questions, the professor led us to suspect that... Radio commentators spread the story to still more listening millions. A strange substance like pale green gelatin. Now it moves and stirs in its confinement, seeking to escape. This strange creation of the and, and speakers denounced Professor Davis. And I ask you, can science be permitted to venture into these forbidden realms unchecked? Who knows what horror may emerge from the laboratory if we are not careful? This mad thing must be stopped. Stopped. Who 
is this? Oh, it's me, Ted. Oh. Ted, did you have any trouble? No, no, I got the medicine for your father, all right, and I, I brought the evening papers, too. What do they say? Pretty bad. They're all using Duncan's story, and he shot the works. Ted, how can he do such a thing? Well, he's a very plausible writer. He has a knack for making people believe him. If anybody accuses him of lying, he'll just say that he was misled by your father. I see. I'm sorry you lost your job trying to help us. Well, that doesn't matter. I was about ready to quit anyway. How, how is your father now? He seems to be sleeping quietly. Well, I'm sticking around until he's all right again. Well, you don't have to do that, Ted. I'll make out. If I hadn't gotten into that fight with Duncan, your father might not have had his stroke. No, it was just the excitement of his heart, but I know how to take care of him. But, Ted, I... I'm frightened. About your father? No. No, about it. The protoplasm. Oh. It's changed just since this morning. It's changed? How? It's grown and... Well, come on, see for yourself. All right. Helen, this seems to be taking on shape. Yes, and it looks... Oh, Ted, it looks like green gelatin. That's the way Duncan describes it. And look, there's a vague shape like a head and, and the rough outline of arms and legs. Oh, Oh, it isn't possible. It shouldn't be, but it's happening. Something terrible is taking place inside that glass tank. I don't understand it. Your father certainly never intended to create this. You know, all afternoon I've been wondering if father really has created it. I don't follow you, Ellen. You mean... You mean some outside force might be responsible? Ted, you know the old saying, believe in a thing enough and it'll come true. Yes, of course. Well, I think that's true. The power of belief is a tremendous thing. People begin to believe that, well, that there's going to be a depression, and there is a depression. Oh, but, Ellen... They begin to believe that strangers and foreigners are enemies, and pretty soon they are enemies. They believe there's going to be a war, and war comes. Well, that's true, but what are you getting at? How many people are reading Dan Duncan's story this very minute, right now, while we're talking? Oh, hundreds of thousands, probably, all over the nation. Maybe a million. And they all believe it's true. Well, a good many of them. Yes, Dan has a genius for being plausible. Then don't you see, Ted? Here in this laboratory is the necessary material for a monster. Huh. And out there are all those people believing in such a fantastic monster. You mean... You mean a million people are thinking life into the protoplasm. Yes, Ted. I know it sounds fantastic, but that monster was never created by my father. Dan Duncan created it when he wrote about it. Well, if that's true... There's no other answer. Over there in that glass tank is something that's alive only because millions of people believe it's alive. No, it is alive. There's no telling what it may become. Ellen, we have to destroy it. It'll break Dad's heart, but we can't let it live. Well, it's growing bigger by the minute. We've got to get rid of it now before it grows any larger. There's acid in those bottles. There, that'll destroy it. All right. Yeah, yeah, I see them. Here. Just as soon as I get it open, it'll take care of the creature. Be careful, Ted. It, it can burn you dreadfully. Ellen, Ellen, what's happening? What are you doing? Dad, darling, you're supposed to be in bed. Yeah, I'm feeling better. I wanted to see how the protoplasm was. Please go back to bed, Dot. Your heart. Oh, my heart's all right, but I must be sure. Oh, it's changed. It's taken on a form. Yes, Professor, a monstrous, unnatural form. It has a head, arms, legs. But it can't have it. It's only protoplasm. It's all impossible. Unfortunately, it's true. I can't explain now, but, well, we've got to destroy it. No, no, the combination of my life's work. You can't destroy we it. We must, then. No, no, I won't let you. It's the only thing to do. Professor, look at it. it it's crawling around inside the tank now. It's, it, it's trying to climb out. But it can't be dangerous. It's just harmless protoplasm. Dad, Ted is right. You've got to let us kill it. It's just protoplasm, I tell you. It was just protoplasm. Stand back, Professor. I'm going to empty this acid on No, no, you mustn't. I will. Dad! Dad! Professor Dad! Davis! Dad! Davis, look up! Why, the tank, he... He fell against the tank and broke it. Is he hurt, Ted? Well, I'll see. Oh. Ted, the protoplasm is moving toward him. We've got to get him out of here. I have his arm. Quick, you take his feet. I'm here. Oh, 
Oh, hurry up, Dick. It's time to crawl out of the tank. Gotta get him upstairs. Can you manage it? Yes, yes. Come. All right, easy now. Easy. Here, Dick. Just a little farther. Here, Dick. Here, Dick. Here, Dick. Here's the landing. We can we can put him down here. Now, easy. Easy. There. Oh. Oh. Dick. Dick, I can't find his pulse. Let me try. Dad? Ted, no use. He's gone. I'm afraid so. His heart failed him. I've always known it would someday. <laughs> Kid, down in the laboratory. Yes, it's moving. Look, it's gotten out of the tank and it's crawling all around the lab. And the only way out is down those stairs and through the lab. We're trapped up here. Look, I'm not saying it isn't a good story, Dan. It's a whale of a story. But McGuire wants some pictures. Pictures? How can I get pictures? I can't even get into the place. I don't care. Just get them. You want me to bust in the window, I suppose. Let your conscience be your guide. And I know you haven't got a conscience. But make it fast. I want those shots for the late morning edition. All right. I'm going. With a camera in one hand and a bunch of skeleton keys in the other. It's looking for food, Ted. Yes, and it's getting frantic. Look how it crawls back and forth through the lab. It's been doing that for an hour now. Look how enormous it's grown. Yeah. So, suppose it tries to come up these stairs to this balcony. Well, it may not. It, it has no eyes, no intelligence. It, it's just protoplasm, blindly seeking food. But suppose it does try to come up the stairs. Well, then we'll stop it. I have the gun here that I found in your father's desk. I'll, I'll use that on it. I don't think it would even feel a bullet. Well, we'll see. There. Now, it's on the other side of the lab now, in plain sight. Stand back there, and I'll, I'll try a couple of shots. I hit it. It didn't even notice. Oh. Well, we could only reach those bottles of acid. That would fix it. But every time we've started down the stairs, it, it's rushed over to wait for us. You must feel the vibration of it. I'm going to take one more try. Ted, please be careful. Yes, I will. I'll tiptoe down one step at a time. Perhaps I can avoid attracting its attention this time. What's it doing now? Lying quiet, as if it was listening. If only lie quiet a few seconds more. I'm almost at the bottom. Ted, quick! It's coming this way! Oh, no, no, no. Oh. oh, Ted, it almost got yes, you. Yes, it did touch my foot, but well, I wasn't interested in getting any better acquainted. What are we going to do now? I don't know. I don't know, Ellen. I... Only reach that acid. Hey, I wonder if it would make any difference if we turned out the light. They can be controlled from up here, can't they? Oh, yes, but what good would that do? Well, in the dark, it might become inactive. Some elementary organisms are like that. Well, we can try it. Okay, I'll, I'll turn out the light. There. Pitch black now. But it's still moving around. Well, well, just wait a moment. Listen. What is it, Tim? I heard footsteps outside the house. Footsteps? Just listen. There's someone coming in the front door. Yeah, there's someone in the lab. But who would... Good heavens, on. Duncan, is that you, Dan? Dan, answer me. Is that you? Get out. Get out. Quick. Okay, kid. Keep your shirt on. I'm going as soon as I get a picture of this joint. But, Dan, you don't understand. It's loose. Get away, quick. Ellen, turn on that light. Yes, Ted. <laughs> you can't scare me, kid. I came to get a picture, and I'm going to get it. Run, Dan, run. Help me. Ellen, Ellen, don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Oh, we've got to stay. Quick, Ellen, the ass. Hurry, Ed, hurry. Oh, oh. Oh, Here, you take this one. Oh, I'll take one. We'll break them over it, understand? Yes, Ted. Well, come on, then. Eating it. I'll throw your bottle now. Don't worry, that's fortunate enough to kill anything. The 
acid is burning into it. It's killing it. Ellen is dying. It's not moving anymore. It's not breathing either. We've killed it. It's starting to melt away. It's dissolving. Now that it's dead, it's turning back into the liquid it started from. The substance that the belief of millions gave an unreal life to. Well, it's gone back to a liquid now. There's nothing left of it. It's gone as if it had never existed. Except for Dan Duncan. Oh, dear. There's nothing we can do for him, Ellen. He's dead. He created the monster. And it's killed him. again. Well, maybe it's true about believing in things and making them happen. Wars and depressions and uh, artificial monsters and things like that. I think I'll make a New Year's resolution to be careful what I believe in 1947. Uh, no more believing in bogeymen or spooks. I might meet one. Instead, I'll try believing in some of the, uh, some of the nicer things for a change such as peace and goodwill among nations. Well, if I can get enough people to join me, maybe they'll come true and... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Toplin, Chuck Webster, Louise Fitch, Wendell Holmes, Edgar Staley, and Bill Smith. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. And now, a preview of next week's strange and shivery story by the mysterious traveler. It's only two days now to New Year's Eve. Were you planning a big celebration to greet 1947? I'd be careful if I were you. Because, you see, our story next week is about a man who did just that. In fact, it was such a big celebration that when he got over it, it wasn't 1947 at all, but 1948. He lost a whole year out of his life. And when he finally got the year back, well, what happened to him shouldn't happen to a werewolf. So take it easy, New Year's Eve, so you'll be sure to be on hand next week for the strange and terrifying tale I call New Year's Nightmare. Mysterious Traveler is presented from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. For a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the workshops of the nation's top mystery writers, be sure to hear Mr. Mystery every week. The famous creators of your favorite fiction battlers will be guests of Mr. Mystery. You'll hear short, short mystery dramatizations as well. Don't miss your chance for plus mystery entertainment and hear Mr. Mystery and a well-known guest expert every week over most of these stations. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. And that's this week's Mutual Presents feature. The Mutual Audio Network brings the best of old-time radio and modern audio theater to the world. Be sure to subscribe through the Mutual Audio Network podcast feed, any of our podcast days, 
or the Mutual YouTube channel, which includes MadCon and many other extra features and shows. See you all next time at Mutual Presents. Good night. Thank you for listening to Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. We invite you to continue the amazing audio tomorrow on Mutual with the Monday Matinee. Our weekly series of dramatic, theatrical, classic, eclectic, and live radio dramas. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed every day for the world's largest curated collection of audio drama. Or find the Monday Matinee feed in your favorite podcast players. See you tomorrow at the Matinee, and thanks so much for listening. The Mutual Audio Drama Network where we listen and imagine together.